Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the great author and boxing historian, trainer, and broadcaster, the legend Teddy Atlas. How you doing, Teddy? Doing okay. You know, always a step behind you, but um, trying, you know, that's part of what keeps me going to try to stay close. Um, you know, I, uh, you, either you got another haircut or you just groom to perfection. <laughs> I was just going to say, you look good. I think you got a haircut. You're looking real good. Yeah, Sharp. Thank you. I, no, I need a haircut, actually, but um, not yet. By the way, I, I mentioned I mentioned uh, great author. I've been re-listening to um, your audio book, um, on my runs and for the people who like audio books check out the audio book but i'm going to hold up the uh physical book as well because that's also great one sec thank you here's what it looks like for people watching atlas from the streets to the ring a son struggled to become a man incredible story of uh teddy's journey into boxing I sincerely, I've listened to it a few times and uh, always pick up something new when I listen to it. I love the stories. Um, but for people who are interested in hearing more about Teddy's background and how he got involved in the sport, give that a shot on audible.com. You can also get it, obviously, on Amazon on paperback. But, yeah, I love I love listening to it again. I appreciate that. So, yes, the great author. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, we... We had talk about great, the great Volkanovski was in action, and um, how quickly things can change, right? I mean, it's a lesson oh, for all it's... of us, a lesson in just for all of us in life that you could be on top of the world one day and then uh, not so much the next, you know. And I mean, this is a guy who was considered maybe the greatest of all time, uh, probably a little over a year ago, and then you know he. He takes that fight up in weight with Makachev, Makachev, and you know loses a very close fight, and then he takes it again. Uh, he had a fight in between that he dominated, but then he takes the rematch with Makachev uh, on fast notice to help the card out because a fight fell through, and UFC always comes up with the names uh, somehow. And, you know, we love him. He's been on this show, but he, 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 part of it, he made a decision to take the money. And how that decision, whatever it's done for his bank account, it has done the opposite for his legacy. I mean, I, to me, he's still one of the greatest. So I don't want to go crazy with that. Um, but he has changed his remembrance and trajectory into history by taking that fight and now he takes the Topuria fight you know down under a uh, great crowd and undefeated fighter oh, give him credit he takes on the best and when you take on the best sometimes you're gonna fail but you know you took on the best um again his one moment he's on top of the Mount Olympus, and the next moment, you know, he's um, he's not. So it, again, it's a lesson in life that you. I guess two sides to the lesson. I didn't give it thought that I was going to talk about this, but two side one that you know enjoy every moment, give your best every moment, which he always did. Um, you never know how things are going to change, you know. Uh, live life to its fullest with humility too and you know obviously uh, gratitude for what you have and hunger to continue having it and doing the right thing living the right way which from all accounts he has uh, but you know to also to also understand you know how again how quickly you know how quickly the script can flip, you know, how quickly, uh, you know, right side up can become upside down uh, in, in, in things, you know. And, um, and also just when you're in that position, your choices of, you know, 
again, going back to he made the choice to take the money uh, in that second market job fight. Uh, you you got to live with those choices. Uh, he's he's as much a man as a man can be. So I'm sure I'm sure he he weighed that and he understood that. You know, um, it is it is part of. You, you do have to make those choices along the way. I guess the reason I'm saying, because then you had guys like Khabib, who, you know, he retired um, at a certain point. You had guys like Jim Brown, the great running back. He retired while there was still left. Khabib retired when there was still left. So, you know, they all did well, obviously, in their professional careers monetarily, too. And they were considered the greatest, uh, both of them. In, in in their you know in their vocations in their in their lane of work but um they are still you know there's still the standard bearer there's still you know there's still the the north star that that guides all the people that are looking for the greats they they look in those directions um i i hope Volkanovski didn't lose that you know, and um, and and then again, look, he took on a he he took on a guy in Topuria again, his competitive juices. He took on the best guy out there, um, undefeated guy, guy who I said on our podcast last week. I broke him down. I thought I broke him down pretty good. That the uh, what a tremendous striker this guy is. I mean, just like he could be a pro fighter. I'll get more into it when we go into the specifics in a minute, um, but. I wonder, there's always X factors. I wonder if an X factor was the the Makachev fight. It was only four months ago, Ken. And yep. you know, he took a you know, he took a damaging kick. He got you know, he got TKO, he being Volkanowski. For me, he was still compromised from that fight. I'm taking nothing yeah. away from Tapuria. Nothing. Nothing. I uh, the guy's unbelievable. But uh I, I believe, and again, those are the things that when you're on your travels, you're on your journey, whatever your journey is, uh, you know, the, they're part of you, have to be part of the the thinking that goes into the process of what's next and what goes with that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I just I just want to say that before I go go into the the actual breakdown of the Volkanovski uh, to purify, which I think is the right place to start. One one thing I want to just say quickly is you mentioned about the breakdown you gave last week on the on Topuria, and that would be a good one for fans who are like the hardcores that want to go back and listen to the way you broke it down because it was pretty accurate and masterful in terms of an, analyzing Topuria's skill set. And that reminds me also, if you're interested in learning more about the sweet science, you could check out Teddy's uh, dynamic striking series. Um, at dynamicstriking.com, there's several, I think, what do you got, like 15 or 16 episodes now? Yeah, thank you. No, we got 18 of them, and 18, a couple yeah. of them are mental ones, where anti-bullying and how do you get more confidence, you know, what it, you know, how how you can make yourself mentally stronger, uh, how you can put the lights on in a dark place, Yeah. Uh, stay out of the, stay out of the gray rooms, as I call them. All that. Yeah. <laughs> They're very, very helpful, especially for young fighters or, and trainers alike to learn some basic fundamentals on all aspects of uh, the sweet science. But sorry, go ahead. Get back to it. Like, how, what do you want to do? You want to run down the um, the main event? We'll start with the um, with the early fights on the main card and work our way towards the main event. Yeah. All right. Whatever. Yeah, that's fine. We could do that. We'll start with Cejudo, Cejudo and Tevishvili, Tevishvili. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, we could. We we'll get to all of, to most of them anyway. Yeah. So yeah, we could start with. We could start. With, I think we're gonna do like four of them. But yeah, Devishev. How you pronounce that man's name? I'm gonna say Devishvili. Devishvili. Marab Devishvili. But we can also call him Marab for short, since that's his first name. The Georgian fighter trains in Strong Island with. Um, 
Matt Serra and the Ray Longo crew. His main training partner is uh, Al Jermaine Sterling, the former champ. Marab looked unbelievable. He basically made Henry Cejudo look like a little brother. At one point, picked him up, carried him almost mockingly to the middle of the cage, laughing along with Mark Zuckerberg, who was sitting the cage side. And literally, I was like, oh, he's going to try and slam him down, but Henry won't get slammed down too hard. And he literally just flung him down like he was a little child. It must have been hard for Henry. Henry and Henry's got a big ego, two division champ, former Olympic gold medalist wrestlers. But I mean, the way Marab handled them as the fight went on, it got worse and worse and just one sided, a one sided beatdown. And it was interesting, too, because they said that Cerruto was going to potentially retire after the fight if he lost. But I love Dana White for his honesty. He said at the press conference, hey, they asked him, hey, Henry was going to retire. And all due respect to Henry, he's, a, like I said, a two-division champ, a former Olympic gold medalist, uh, triple seed. And uh, Dana said, he already had a retirement here. If he wants to go on a retirement tour, he can come in and do it in the press conference. But we're not, this was Marab's night. We're not going to, uh, you know, upstage Marab and let Henry steal the show with his retirement. He retired once already. He came back. And this is the way we do it here in the UFC. And I just love the all business approach there's no sentimental bs there it's like all business and um yeah it had to be a rude awakening for henry to be handled in the way that he was but what'd you think of the fight how do you like marab yeah marab is the way we'll go because my son who's smarter than me <laughs> teddy the third told me uh dad marab all right marab. <laughs> uh first round you know marab showed a little vulnerability he rushed in uh, a little reckless, reckless aggression, and Sudo countered him with a really beautiful counter left hook uh, to slow him down for a minute. So it showed that he has some vulnerability, maybe in the striking area where he can get a little, you know, over aggressive, um, leave a little space between the punches. But he is a monster. Marab, then he got a takedown. And scored a knockdown, um, and both, you know, it went into the second round, and um, Sukuro knew what he had to do. You know, all his experience that you just touched on, and all his accomplishments, and how how great he's been. He knew that this guy is really physically strong, uh, and he. He needed to move on the outside with his legs, and he was looking for the right entrance, you know, where he could get in safely. And for a while there, they traded some nice shots where it was like rock'em, sock'em yeah. robots, where Marab uh, then wound up getting a takedown and was, uh, you know, was imposing his physicality. As you touched on when he picked him up in the air, he, he was... It was imposing his physicality on, on Zuhudo, who's getting older. And um, it was, as you said, amazing at the... Uh, well, no, you didn't touch on this one, but amazing at the end of the round uh, where I think it was the second round where Zuhudo just refused to submit to a... It looked like a clean guillotine choke um, that yeah. he was in. And um, Marab was in charge at that point. Uh, continued in the third round. Just looked younger and stronger. I don't know what his age is, but he just looked younger, stronger, fresher. Uh, as you touched on, he picked him up in the air, walked him across the octagon, slammed him down. At the end of the day, the best description I could give overall is that it was... Marab, Mar Marab is 33, by the way. Yeah, the best... What is Cejudo, by the way? Um, and Cejudo is... Um so who knows, 30, 37, but probably has more years than, than someone else 37, given all of his Olympic pedigree and all the training he's done for his no, whole that's life. That's why I brought it up. There's some yep. miles on the odometer. Um, look, at the end of the day, the way I would sum it up is that Marab gave, his performance was cyborg-like. Mm -hmm. that, that's what it was for me. It was cyborg-like. I mean, like he's uh, inhuman almost. But um, anyway, uh, machine-like. I guess that's his name. I wasn't even thinking when I said cyborg. I guess that it's his nickname, 
uh, the machine. So anyway, let's go right, right into the next UFC. I'm going to go into Gary and Neil. Um, that's yep. that's what I got in front of me anyway. Uh, yep. Gary, look, Gary, Gary is tall, lean, long. He uh, he's undefeated. They want to try to make him a star. He's got a good following, like Patty the Batty, in that kind of way. He's got a good following from from across the pond, and uh, oh, he's got to fight a very specific way, and he did. He's got a controlled distance. He's not real physical, um, although I'm sure he's physical when he has to be. But I mean, he's got the body with the length and everything that I just touched on where he's got to fight tall and he knows how to fight tall where some people don't know how he knows how to fight tall he used his jab he stayed outside moving his legs to keep distance very important for him uh countering well as Neil you know came forward uh you know it was a good test for for Gary too uh with Neil but he was I was impressed the way that Gary understood he he knew his he knew his ID he knew his you know what he has to be what what you know a fighter needs to know what he is he, he can't be Joe Frazier one minute and Muhammad Ali the next he's got to know what you know what his identity is and Neil understands that um to be successful he's got to control outside Counter punch the crap out of you, control real estate, and make you pay a price for that real estate when you try to get in. And Gary did that. He um he threw combinations when Neil tried to close the gap. He also threw some really unbelievable knees. Uh on the inside when Neil got close, he knows how to defend the takedowns, which of course we saw guys like Alessandro, who was a great striker, get better and better and better. They were masterful in those areas. They need to be at that next level. Um, it reminds me a little bit, a little. I'll explain it out, a little bit of Sean O'Malley, just that it's all about the striking and his legs to set up the striking. In that way, O'Malley is more advanced as far as overall talent and abilities to counterpunch and strike and the, the level that he's on, of course, being a champion now. But I saw those similarities where obviously they're both really strikers for the most part, although O'Malley can handle himself on a mat, give him credit for that, and he made sure that he could by putting himself through the process and his journey to get to where he got to, to learn that and put himself in those areas, uh, in those situations uh, to be tested there uh, and developed there, but um, he's got he's got good hand speed, Gary. Uh, he's also, you know, it, it was uh, the first round. Um, I thought Gary won it, but uh, it was very close. Second round. Neil started to get closer. He closed the distance better in spots. In the third round, Gary did a better job again of keeping separation, not letting Neil get you know into his geography, uh, countering Neil you know with again with some legs and strikes landed, um, some good body kicks and knees. Credit Neil. He also landed some good strikes when he was able to close the gap. And, and catch Gary standing up. That's one of the dangers when you're a tall guy, when your opponent does close the gap. There's a lot of target all of a sudden to catch. It was a split decision. Um, I had it 2-1 to one for Gary. Uh, not an exciting fight, but a, a smart, you know, effective win uh, for Gary. And credit to him for what really got him the win for fighting his fight, you know, which is, I think for him, there's some guys that can fight the other guy's fight and they can still win. For the most part, I think Gary's a guy who's always going to have to fight his fight to really have an edge. And um, he controlled the geography of the octagon pretty well. So 
that's you know that's how I saw him in that one, and and that would at least for me, unless you want me to go to another one, I would go to Whitaker Costa. Um, yeah, that's next first round. First of all, Whitaker, you know, coming back uh, after a devastating loss uh, to to Costa, who's now uh, not Costa to uh, DDP. To Duplessis. No, Duplessis he lost to. Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. DDP. Drake oh, okay. is Duplessis. They call yeah. him DDP. Yeah. I thought that was some oil you were talking about or something for, <laughs> for, for one of your Ferraris. Um, I didn't realize. But, yeah, Whitaker, look, Whitaker, I love Whitaker. He's a real complete fighter. I love Costa. He's a strong, Herculean-looking guy. I don't know how he makes the weight. Very powerful. Very game, as most of them are, or all of them are, wouldn't be in this business if they weren't. I had picked Whitaker. I, I sent out some Texas with my text machine uh, out there, my, te- my what's it called, X now, whatever, tweets, tweets, Xs, whatever they are. Uh, I sent them out, my my great Xing team. It used to be a tweeting team. Now it's an Xing team. Uh, they got them out there. Uh, I, I had picked Whitaker to win I just thought, you know, his technique would would sort of pave the way for him, and he looks so focused, Ken. He mentally, because mental part of this game, same as my game in boxing, seventy five percent of it, he he looked locked in mentally. I mean, Costa looked in great shape, and he was, but Whitaker looked mentally locked in, like he knew what he had to do. He knew he was coming from, what he had lost, what he was looking to gain back. And what he was dealing with, and he was he was ready. Um, first first round, Whitaker again talking about technique, great jab, uh, beautiful counters. He looked very sharp and strategic. Uh, he used leg kick, kicks uh, also to try to keep the bigger Costa from being set uh, to kick or punch. But at the end of the round. Costa caught him. You know, that's one thing in boxing. You got to worry about the punches. You don't got to worry about the legs or the elbows or the knees, <laughs> you know, or being thrown to the mat. But you got to, I, I can't give enough respect to these guys for the myriad of things they have to deal with. It's like, I know people are going to laugh when I say this, but it's like watching that early part of The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> When Dorothy and the whole house gets caught up in a tornado and starts getting whirled through the air and there's cows flying around, there's <laughs> there's trees flying around, there's houses flying around, everything's flying around all over the place. That is MMA. That is the octagon. You got everything flying around. Everything. Uh, except cows, maybe. <laughs> And that's why I have so much respect for these guys. How good you have to be technically and mentally to deal with that. Um, anyway, at the end of the first round, what was that? A wheel kick, Ken? I don't even know what it was. But uh, all I know it was a kick to the head. They're not good. They're not good. <laughs> and it hurt Whitaker badly. I get. I tell you, what a chin Whitaker must have because all head. I know. It's crazy. Because he gets caught that and he don't get knocked out. He gets wobbled. Yeah. And he's fortunate it happened at the end of the round. But let me tell you something. I don't I don't make it a given that if it didn't happen at the if it happened a little earlier, that he wouldn't have survived. Because he was still yeah. punching back. He was still getting himself together. He was pulling himself together. He knew he had to pull himself together. He didn't know how much time was left in the round. So he knew he had to pull and he was calling on himself. Calling on himself. You know, uh, get get together, get together. That's what you do when you get hurt. You call on yourself. I refuse to go to that dark room that I'm being dragged to. I'm being dragged down the corridor to a dark room. I, I, I refuse to go there. And and he pulled himself out of it. I know, again, the bell obviously was was helpful to be when it was, but he still was punching. He was still trying to get himself together and getting himself together. Anyway, uh, it was all, first round was all Whitaker, 
and then Costa, I guess, depending on how you score it, grabbed that round with the kick, and uh, you know, and then the second round, Costa off of that was looking very confident, very strong. But Whitaker was scoring with those beautiful combinations he puts together. And again, very sharp. Uh, he won the second round for me. So it was 1-1 going into the final round. And um, I had to make a note to myself. Those kicks of Costa are so... He, he's incredible for a guy that big and that strong and that looking like uh, Hercules. I never saw Hercules throw kicks like that. You know, <laughs> I, I saw him pick up, you know, rocks and mountains and stuff and throw those, but never kicks like that. Uh, man, he throws fast, powerful kicks. Uh, he was the physically stronger man. Uh, Whitaker was better technically, as I said in my tweets before the fight, uh, and especially with his striking. At the end of the day, the jab and the head movement of Whitaker which set up the punches uh, that he was able to put together, won the day for him. Uh, Costa applied a lot of pressure in that last round, but Whitaker dominated the last round with his jab. I thought, I thought he won the fight either two to one or three to nothing. You could have possibly gave it to him three nothing, depending on what you did with that kick at the end of the first round. Did you, did you forget about everything Whitaker did? The first, you know, two four minutes and fifty seconds of the round, or or you know, did you give him credit for basically controlling that round up until that point? Um, but uh, I, I, I Whitaker's back. You know, he he needed to have that kind of performance with a you know top level guy. He he did have that performance. Uh, I give him credit. These these guys, you know, it's one thing to win, period, in this difficult business. But then to be coming off, you know, having been, you know, beaten the way he was with, I don't know if that was his last fight. I think it was. Uh, with Duplessis. That was his last fight, right? With Duplessis. To come off of that. For Whitaker? For, yeah. You know, to shrug off the effects of that, you know, Ken? Um, yep, you got to give him a ton of ton of credit uh, to be able to. Yeah, that was in July to yep. do that. Yeah, so was I'm trying to think if there was another one that I wanted to touch, or if that takes us to to right to Volkanovski. That takes us to the main event. Unless you wanted to hit the yeah. quickly the Anthony Hernandez, we won by a uh, rear naked choke over Roman Kopalov. I didn't in the see first. that one. Okay. I okay, didn't see no that problem. one. My television. So we'll was, go right to the main event. Yeah, my TV or my my streaming, whatever the hell that is. When you get the pay per view from the, uh, you know, from ESPN Plus. Yeah. It was throwing kicks at me. Okay, and I was <laughs> trying not to get knocked out by those kicks, and it took me a minute to get to watch the show, but I finally got just in time for the ones I said. What I said last week, I mean, I thought Volkanovski, with his experience, I, I favored him to, to pull it off, but I knew how dangerous this fight was. I, I, um, I think I framed the whole, the whole breakdown last week of this fight around that. This is a guy that could be the next great one. Um, he's that good. I had watched this fight closely with Emmett. He showed a good shin besides everything else because Emmett can knock down buildings. Although Emmett never <laughs> caught him square on, but still, he caught him enough a little bit where it showed me he's got that shin, he's got that belief, he's got that concentration, he's got that resolve, he's got that it factor that he's not going to cave in, that he's not going to, you know, he's not going to allow himself to be taken to that, down that corridor I was talking about where you get taken to a dark place. Uh... And great hand speed. Again, he looks like a pro boxer to me sometimes. Great hand speed, great power, puts combinations together beautifully, controls range beautifully. Um, he can step in and out, or he can press you, and that's what he did with Volkanovski. He pressed him, but he pressed him <laughs> buttoned up. He, he 
press them like you would press somebody in a Sherman tank. Uh, you know, <laughs> really. He, he covered up. He, he had the armor around him. Uh, he was patient. He was controlled. He doesn't waste a damn thing. He's got good vision, great eyes, sees everything. Uh, like I said, he doesn't waste a damn thing. He, he's precise. He's calm and calculating, so calm in an uncalm, uncalm environment. The great ones always are. The special ones always are. And he just went about his business. He, he, was, like, he knew what he was going to do. He, he tracked Volkanovski down. The first round, Volkanovski was kicking, moving, trying to keep Tapuria from closing, he looked pretty good, Volkanovski, first round. You know, tried to keep more balance. Uh, he knew what he was dealing with, a, powerful, a guy who could punch, a guy who had fast hands. So he was trying to keep him from getting set um, to punch. And uh, Tuperia, again, not only good, but part of him being good is his cerebral part, smart. Talented, technically buttoned up, so solid technically. Uh, he he caught he caught uh, Volkanovski with a big front leg kick, um, which he which he does besides his striking ability, which he throws really you know really well, um, really solid, and um, yeah, Topurio. Uh, was catching Volk. It, it was a. Uh, it kind of was a. Uh, it was a telling of what was going to happen, if you if you could follow it that way, because he was. It, it was a. Uh, a forecast of bad weather to come, so to speak. That there was <laughs> cumulus clouds coming, because he Topuria, even though it wasn't significant. He was catching Volk with right hands as Volk was stepping out, trying to keep out of range and try to keep Tapiri off bounds, which he needed to do. And um, he was, he, he was, you could see he was like, he had like radar where he, once he saw that Volk was stepping out, he saw a pathway um, and he started to explore that pathway to get to him with the right hand. And he, he put it in his computer for the next round. Volk, Volk was the busier man, mixing it up, movement, kicks, strikes. Very close first round, very close. Uh, and then the second round, of course, when the curtain came down. And what better way to announce that you're here, you're here to stay, you're here to be special, than to knock out on a stage like that a guy who, like I said, a year ago was considered one of the greatest of all time. Um, you know, and it's still one of the greatest. But what a way, what a way. Talk about going on Broadway and becoming a star. Uh, you couldn't have drew it up if you scripted it better for Tuperia. Um, yep. He pressed the fight, with again, with smart, well covered up protection behind his jab. That's the right way to do it. Uh, Volkanovski was moving, picking spots, but then all of a sudden, Topuria, what he saw from the first round, he exploded forward. He exploded forward and he used a combination of what I call throwaway punches, a right hand to the body, a left hook to the head, and then a another right hand to the head and he used those punches to move Volkanovski, the great Volkanovski, to move him back into position where he could then have a chance to land the punch he wanted to land, the right hand, the finishing punches. Brilliantly done. Brilliantly done. As cerebral as it gets, as technical as it gets, did it fluidly did it without hesitation. The moment was there. I think he saw the opportunity in the first round. And he saw Volkanovski pull him back. 
what does he do? He throws those that set of three punches to move him all the way back, to position him where his head would be where he wanted it to be. And then I didn't miss this. At the end of all that, a little subtle step to the right before he throws the right hand, which put him in perfect, perfect position to land the right hand as Volkanovski at that point had been set up for the kill, had had been moved into position where he was in perfect, perfect alignment to get caught standing straight up, vulnerable as hell, with a right hand. And, and I got to repeat it. A small little subtle step to the right by Tiberia before he threw. Patience. On top of all that talent, on top of all that technique, on top of all that that explosive ability, speed, power, patience, eyes, to step a little bit to the right where he had the perfect alignment for the right hand. He reminded me a little bit of a young Pacquiao where Pacquiao was so explosive, Ken, taking those steps. The, that first move to get in. You know, everyone said, oh, you know, you could see Pacquiao exploded with his punches, but he would also get there with his feet so yeah. he could explode with his punches. And I saw both of that with Topuria, where he he exploded forward quick with his feet, and then, of course, he set off the dynamite with the right hand. It was... Uh, uh, Again, just if if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna set off fireworks somewhere and say, hey, it's the Fourth of July, or you're gonna put one of those, you know, you're gonna put one of those, fla- those big giant uh, flash lights, search lights up in the air to show that you got a new restaurant open and you want everyone to come. He did that. He did the fireworks. He did the searchlight in the sky. You know, uh, he he flew the plane over with the with the trailing uh, <laughs> messaging. You know, f- trailing behind the plane. He when you always see when you're down this beach, you know, and you, yep. and you see them fly that over. You know, uh, party at at you know uh, big big Johnny's uh, Friday night, whatever. Well, the party was. Uh, down under for the victor and the new well the the new man in town uh Tuperia, yeah. you know the maybe the new great one yep no it was a great show exciting all around um there were a bunch of boxing matches no real huge names in action but we had some action but you know what it is ken we want to we try i hope they you know I don't know. We try to satisfy all the boxing fans. Of course. And we could skip some of these, but we don't. That's right. I mean, sometimes we do if, if it's not po- humanly possible. But when it's possible, and I'm sure our fans, I'm sure they appreciate it. I'm sure they do. Of course. In between throwing, in between throwing rocks at us and, you know, every once in a while, a couple of... Uh, a couple of slinging arrows, but they're still here. Yeah, before we jump into those real quick, just want to give a shout out to Box Raw. If um, if you're into boxing, whether you're training professionally or as an amateur and you want to look the part, go to BoxRaw.com and check out the 36 collection from Teddy Atlas, 36 Minutes to Make Life Fair. That's where the 36 come, comes from. You can check out all the apparel at BoxRaw.com. Additionally, Everyone should be taking their health and wellness seriously, and there's nothing you can do more important than taking the right supplements, and that includes Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of a special offer for our listeners. 
10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Athletic Greens is the all-in-one green drink made from 75 whole food source ingredients. This stuff was developed with the input of top doctors, nutritionists, and scientists around the world. It really is that good. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage. Like I said, 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. I, especially when you're traveling, you should be taking all your vitamins, minerals, nutrients to make sure you're on top of your body's health and immunity. Um, with that, Teddy. Oh, and another thing, if you want to get more boxing coverage, you can check out Teddy's uh, Pro Box Show with Pauli Malinaji and um, Chris Algieri. Um, you can find that at, on the Pro Box Show. Just search Pro Box Show and you'll find all the information there. Um, let's get into the boxing, Teddy. Uh, Bruce Shushu Carrington with a potential knockout of the year at featherweight over Bernard Torres. Fourth round, vicious knockout. Real quick, what'd you think of the knockout? What'd you think of uh, Bruce Chushu Carrington? Yeah, again, you know, we don't have to cover all these fights, but we know that you we got passionate fans out there, and we want to try to really try to get the whole landscape whenever we can, even if we got to do it fast. So, we, he's Carrington is uh, up and comer. He's eleven and zero now, seven knockouts. Uh, he actually, I knew him when he was 12 years old, 11 years old. Uh, he started in one of my Dr. Atlas Foundation gyms that we, that we funded for 10 years. We created actually some of them, uh, the one in Brooklyn and one of the ones on Staten Island. We actually, we actually created, but we ran them so obviously kids could get off the street and, um, give them refuge, give them a place to, to, to have a safe haven, you know, from the streets and to develop and to, you know, really keep them away from some of the dangers out there. The people might laugh, say, but isn't boxing dangerous? Not as dangerous as life can be sometimes, let me tell you, uh, if you grow up in some of those areas. And so we we ran the gyms for that reason, and some of the kids became uh, obviously good fighters, and he's one of them, and he was a good kid. You know, I haven't seen him for a while, but I knew him all the way up to the time that he, he won the New York Golden Gloves, and he was always a good kid, uh, and a, a good kid with a lot to overcome. He came from the Bed-Stuy, Brownsville area in Brooklyn, and a lot, you know, a lot of difficult things that, uh, for, for the same reason I just mentioned that we opened the gyms for kids that grew up in difficult areas where sometimes things could get in the way of you fulfilling your potential in life or having a life uh, out on the streets. They, they can stop you, stop you dead short, dead short. Well, there's a reason they call it bed sty, do or die. And look, there's a lot of tough areas out there. And um, he came from a tough area. He had difficult things to overcome in life. One of them, uh, a brother, a brother was was killed by the streets, shot to death uh, on the streets. Uh, Shushu dealt with all of that. The gyms helped him, I'm sure, and um, he 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 got past. He survived all that, and now here he is on ESPN. I was happy to see him there. Uh, he's at the place now where it's time to step up now more. Torres was, you know, a, a nice showcase fight for him, um, and he did just that. He showcased that there's more to, there's reason to watch him now, but now it's time to step up to take those steps uh, even more so. But uh, he did it in a sensational way. He did it with one hand, not the left hand. The conventional way to do it is with the left hand, you don't see a lot of guys triple up right hands, and that's what he did. He threw a right hand on top to, again, throwaway punches, right hand up top, uh, you know, to distract Torres, then a the right uppercut underneath uh, to catch him, and then a the right hand back up top uh, to, you know, to finish the job. Uh, really, really technically a beautiful combination. Uh, the talent with it, to get the results that it got. And uh, 
now now he now he continues to move you know now it's time to continue to move forward and increase the competition uh you know properly so but to increase it so you continue to be in a position where you're going to learn something and where you're going to get better um but again beautiful combination nice nice uh just nice introduction to the boxing fans that didn't know him uh, to, to be on that, uh, to win that way on ESPN. The next one I'll get to, maybe you, you could set it up, but uh, would be Forced Nova. And first thing I want to, I just want to say, some of these fights I did not watch the whole fight. We always have full disclosure. I was, there were so many fights on. One of the fights was Thursday night. These were Thursday and Friday, by the way. And That's um, right. one of the fights was Thursday, so we'll get to that one too. But some of them, I couldn't see the whole fight because I went from one to the other. I had to make a choice which one I was going to stay with. But go ahead, Ken. Well, the other thing I was going to say is you mentioned that the Dr. Atlas Foundation um, funded some of these gyms. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can search Dr. Atlas Foundation. And, uh, you know, as everyone knows, the Thursday before Thanksgiving every year, Rob, Teddy, and myself are all at Teddy's uh, big annual fundraiser at the Hilton on Staten Island. Everyone's welcome there. Buy a ticket. Come and support a good cause. But anytime you can make a co contribution all year round at the Dr. Atlas Foundation, all the money goes directly to the community in Staten Island, and a lot of it goes to these different boxing facilities. Not, not just Staten Island, not just Staten Island. We we help people all over the world wherever Correct. the need is. That's I, right. Actually, as you're saying it, I remember one time, people, I, I was even shocked. We got a we got a a request from Africa. Um, I think it was Zambia. Um, and it was a it was a, a a young man, a man, well, young man, but a man with a family that had cancer, and in in the area, that's why you got to be so fortunate, so blessed, and so grateful if you're born in this country. He was born in a country where they didn't have the medical facilities to to treat him properly, and it was basically a death sentence because either you. Either you had money and you could have a chance to get some treatment, although they still didn't have the proper level of treatment for what he had in over there. But or if you don't have money, uh, again, this country you get taken care of. Some countries, no, you don't. And so they had reached out. Somebody on his behalf reached out to us that he needed to, you know, get treatment, get surgery, get chemo, the whole thing. And so we wound up flying them to India. Well, we found out that India made more sense, couldn't get them here, uh, made more sense, was obvious the treatment was, was good. Uh, I was kind of surprised to hear that. The treatment was very good for what he had. Obviously, he, again, he couldn't get that treatment where he was. And it was much more, uh, it made much more sense and trying to get him here, we couldn't get him here, um, and course wise and everything, and we were able to, you know, prolong his life to to do the surgery, do the chemo, fly him and his wife to India while they got the treatments, and uh, so because of good people out there, and I appreciate Ken mentioning it, but we 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 can only do what we do because of the good people out there that give us the resources to help uh, to do it. Well, we can't do it otherwise. I remember years ago, there was a case that <laughs> there was a it was a ten year old kid living in the projects that had cancer and was getting chemo, and it came to us that he lived in a in his in his apartment and he had his room he had no bed, and I was you know in this great country every kid should have a bed, so we made a plan. When he was out one day, Ken, doing his chemo treatment, we came in and did a little Dr. Atlas. Uh, you know, remember that show, the, the house uh, restoration, where they would redo a house for somebody? Yeah. Well, we, we didn't do a house. We did a, we did a room. <laughs> we did our own little version. And while he was out, we put a bed in there. We found out he liked pirates. We, we got somebody to paint a pirate. 
uh, a mural uh, on the wall. Uh, he had no TV. We gave him a TV. We gave him dresses and drawers. Um, but the main thing was we gave him a bed. And the reason I bring this up, and I thank everybody, is when he came home, usually I'm not around. I don't want to be around. But this one, I was selfish. I was selfish. I told the mother, can I stay around, see his reaction? And she said, of course. When he came home, he got so excited. The first thing he did was he jumped on the bed. He jumped on the bed up and down. My bed, I got a bed, I got a bed, I got a bed. And he's jumping up and down. So the mother, being a good mother, you know, said to him, all right, finally calm down. You have to thank this man for doing that. And I stopped the mother very politely. I said, no, no, it's not me. And um, so the kid said, who do I, who, who, who did it? You know, who do I thank? I said, well... Nobody specifically, but there's thousands of people out there that you don't know. And you're probably never going to meet them. But they care about you. And they gave me the, they told me to go get you a bed. <laughs> they told me to go get you a bed. And I'm the one who gets the credit for it. I'm the one who gets here to see you jumping up and down and, and, and be happy and your mother be happy. But it's all those people out there that got this for you because they care about you and they love you. So that's kind of how I look at the foundation. All those people out there, all the masses of people that donate, that come to the dinner like you and Rob and all the celebrities that come every year to help us make it such a big night and make it a night that people want to come. They're the ones. They're, they're the ones that are changing lives. They're the ones that are saving lives. Um, they're the ones who made it possible for the boxing gyms that the foundation funded for 10 years to get kids off the street to be there. And I'll leave it with this. A lot of top fighters have come out of those gyms. but And I'm, uh, I'm proud of them. If they, as long as they're good people, I'm proud of them. That's all, that's all I care about. Not that they're good fighters. They're good people too. But the the one story that will always be at the top of the list, the one accomplishment, achievement, if you will, coming out of that gym, there was a girl in a Brooklyn gym years and years ago that was living in a car with her mother. And after she came to the gyms, she got her confidence, she, she lost weight, you know, she, she improved in school, all the things that were part of the kind of part of the rules to come to the gym. You had to go to school. You, you had to do things like that. Uh, you had to be respectful of people. Anyway, she's in the United States Navy. <laughs> she never became a champion fighter, but she's on her way to being a champion human being. So, again, thank you for mentioning the foundation. I I just wanted to make that clear that it's not me. Uh, it's you that that does the things that um, that make a difference in this world at times. So anyway, let's get to the next fight that I guess was on a roster there. Um, which yep. one was it? Next, next up, Oshaki Foster continues his uh, reign. He retains his WBC Junior Lightweight title in a split decision win over Abraham Supernova. Uh, back and forth action here. I thought it was a good fight. Um, Nova looked good early, and then Foster started to turn it on around the turn it on around the fifth, and then took over late in the fight. But um, good action scores were 116 111 15 12 and 114 113 um Oshaki scores a 12th round knockdown to seal the deal how'd you like that one I only saw parts of it full disclosure because I was watching another fight that I made a choice to watch instead um which turned out to be a good choice because it was a hell of a fight and it was a chance to watch one of the greatest things you can watch in life or witness in life somebody gain redemption. I I think we all love the redemption story. 
So I decided to watch that fight, which I'll talk about in a little while. But um, it was, uh, as you said, I guess Nova had been winning early. Uh, he was a huge underdog. But then Forster, the champion, came back, uh, took over with his superior speed and technique. Uh, I, I saw the end of the last round uh, where Forster scored a knockdown with a nice kind of left hook as Nova came in reaching and a little sloppy, uh, a little reckless, exposing himself. Um, that that told the whole story for me with with the with a little bit of being bolstered by people telling me that, yeah, uh, Nova had been ahead early and then, you know, F Foster took over late. Uh, that that took that told me everything. That the superior technique, uh, you know, wound up carrying him uh, down the stretch, uh, separated him uh, down the stretch, you know, uh, without getting into conditioning, any of those things, which obviously I didn't get a chance to, to weigh or, or to gauge. But uh, I, I saw the difference at the end with the technique. So uh, Forster, Forster gets that. What other, we, what other boxing uh, are we going to... Um. Jesus Perez gets an upset win over Jojo Diaz at super lightweight split decision. Tough loss for Jojo Diaz uh, trying to make a comeback here. I think Jojo is like three, three, two wins, three losses in his last five. I'm going to double check that. But Jojo looks to be uh, at the end of the road here, unfortunately. Um, Jesus Perez upsets Jojo Diaz. Yeah, Diaz, former champion. Uh, Perez, great story. Construction worker gets up at five in the morning, has to you know train and then go to work. Uh, you know he couldn't afford like some guys when they're fighting at especially at the top now, couldn't afford to just fight. He had to work. Uh, a real good feel good story. Now he was able to get a full camp. He was able to just concentrate on training. Uh, Diaz also a former Olympian, you know, uh, and was, as you said, Perez was the underdog, but Diaz definitely, you know, he hasn't done well in his last several fights coming up short. He's definitely not at the same place he was a few years ago. He's getting old, um, but... I'll give him credit. For a guy getting old, first of all, he fought a top guy. Uh, and he was the one coming on at the end. Actually, it was a 10-round fight. If it was a 12-round fight, it probably would have it, it served him a little bit better. But at the end of the day, all the credit to Perez. First thing I want to say, I, I made a note to myself. I've said this before, but do you notice that you know, on the, the zone, there's two promoters. You either have Golden Boy, De La Hoya, or you, you have Eddie Hearn. I don't know, but every time there's a Golden Boy production, which this was, I, I just, it just doesn't have the, the same big show feel or look in their production. Well, like Dana White would say, it's uh, they look like they're going out of business sales. It's like, guys, we got the money together to do this event. Don't go crazy on the expenses. We won't be back next week. As opposed to, let's make this production kick ass. Any of the F any of the equipment needed, we'll use it next week. Now, obviously, UFC has a big advantage, but they started from nothing. They didn't have any advantages to begin with. They just put on a master class in terms of developing a sport. And it's so evident. I mean, look at the difference in the production from the UFC to, like you said, like a Golden Boy show. It looks like it could be in a VFW half the time. Yeah, not only going, uh, not only with comparing it to no, that's know, right. All of them, all the boxing yeah, not promotions. Only compa yeah, but not only comparing Golden Boy and a and a you know the the UFC uh, to UFC and the uh, the drop off with UFC, which of course has all the resources to do great shows, and they they gained those resources by building a company the way they did. But Hearn, Hearn's her. 
Eddie Hearn is the other promoter on the zone. His productions always look much better. They 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 That's just right. they always look just just a class ahead of Golden Boys. I I don't understand who they. Yeah. Quality control people at Golden Boy, or who's paying attention? <laughs> no one. Clearly, they don't have quality control. I'm not trying to be funny, but I mean, you know how it is, Teddy. If you see some of these smaller boxing shows, if they're not big pay per view events, you go to them, and it looks like it's something that a high school production company put on. Some of them are just really bad, and that goes for oh, all of them. Right. Well, at the end of the day, uh, it's noticed once again. But Diaz. As far as the fight goes, Diaz, not a puncher. A guy who, you know, usually busy, pretty good counter puncher. Uh, Perez was ready. I mean, you could see it. Ken, you could just see he was, I know everyone's supposed to be ready, but he was ready. He knew the moment. He knew it was his moment. He knew what it would mean if he won. It would change his life. He wouldn't have to work maybe anymore. Uh, you know, he could concentrate just on training as he did for this fight, which gave him better preparation. Uh, he went to the body really well. He was uh, countering. He was sharp, mixing up counters along with leads, getting off first, changing it to counters sometimes. Uh, again, as proof to what I was saying about he finally got a full camp. He didn't have to also work construction. He came in the lightest weight of his career, um, Perez, <laughs> Uh, for this fight, and um, he was he was able to, you know, to train a full camp. It it obviously made a difference. Uh, he 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 was busier throughout the fight. Uh, he took control early on. He won the first round. Perez second round. Perez was using the uppercut well. Uh, both fighters were right there in front. You didn't have to look for either one of them. It made for you know made for a, a pleasing fight to watch. Uh, they were right there. A big dominant second round for Perez. As I started to say, Ken, he took charge. You know when you're fighting you, as the underdog, you kind of want to put your your flag in the ground early on and and say, hey, I'm here. I'm here. I'm not here. You know just to uh, show up. Uh, get a payday. No, I'm here to win. I'm here to win. I don't care if I'm the underdog. And um, he did that. Big second round, big dominant second round. Took charge of the fight right there. Uh, anything that Diaz did, Perez came right back with his own, uh, getting in the last word or the last punches. Third round, Perez was uh, outworking Diaz, being the boss. Diaz landed some nice counters. Uh, I thought the commentators seemed to be, I don't know, noticing anything Diaz did, but at least early on, not as much of what Perez did, but it didn't bother Perez. He couldn't hear it anyway. The fourth round, Perez is throwing combinations. Diaz is throwing one, two at a time. Big fourth round for Perez. Fifth round, Perez uh, likes to double and triple up and even quadruple. Uh, the right hand, kind of like when we talked about Shushu Carrington. Uh, you don't see that too often. Uh, unusual to see a guy double and tripling up a right hand, but he did. Uh, you could see Perez knew uh, this was, as I said, th this was his moment. Uh, he wasn't going to let it get away. Fifth round, Diaz had a point deducted for throwing and shoving Perez through the ropes. Uh, obviously, he was getting frustrated. Uh, sixth round, Perez refuses to allow Diaz to get control to fight. He comes right back with his own. Seventh round, while Diaz did pick spots to land some counters, the volume of Perez was overwhelming. Um, and seventh round, as also Diaz landed some nice counters, but Perez just way outworked him. Um, the eighth is where it changed. The eighth round, uh, the commentators, first of all, they made it sound close. I didn't think it was close. Uh, or At that point, I thought it was all Perez. I really did. I thought it was all Perez. Uh, and I, I wasn't sure what they were watching. But 
the eighth <laughs> round. If maybe they woke up Diaz by I don't know by forecasting that it was close, and Diaz said, "Okay, I better then make it close or try to make it close because the eighth round was a good round for Diaz. It was his best round, I thought, of the night. Uh, the only clear round that I had really thought that I could give him clearly. Uh, ninth round, Diaz needed uh, back-to-back rounds, being that I thought he was." you know, well behind, um, to partner with the, you know, with the good eighth, uh, to keep the momentum going his way. And, um, he got it. Good counters by Diaz, uh, landed clean shots. Uh, he picked spots. Well, he, he got a little dirty in the ninth round, used his shoulder to bang up against Perez on the inside into his head. Uh, Perez came back strong, but it was definitely Diaz's round. Then the 10th round, the final round, Diaz, to his credit, he showed uh, his experience. Um, he used it down the stretch. Uh, like I said, 8th, ninth, and 10th round, he stepped it up. He, he, he won those rounds. He won the 10th round too. But honestly, the last three rounds were really the only ones that I could give Diaz Jr., uh, I didn't keep score, but I probably had it seven rounds to three for Perez. And don't forget, in the fifth round, Diaz had a point deducted. So, you know, that could have been a 10-8 round for Perez. But I thought it was, I, I didn't think it was a hard fight, Ken, to really score. The the rounds that Diaz won, he landed the cleaner shots, and it was clear to see the rounds that Perez won uh, that he completely, just completely outworked him. Um, uh, and again, the ugly shadow of controversial judging, or in this case, one judge had to, you know, rear his head again and show up with a 99-90 scorecard by Lou Moret. <laughs> Not, I mean, Ken. <laughs> Ken. I mean, <laughs> Really? The, There's the no, only, no shame whatsoever. No, Ken, uh, uh, the, the only question when I heard that scorecard was where did Moret fill out his scorecard? Because it definitely wasn't at ringside. You know, like... like When he got his paycheck. Yeah, did he, did he fill it out in his hotel room? Uh, did he fill it out on the airplane? You know, did he fill it out at home, wherever he lives? Uh Again, just another example. I talk about the sport is great. The fighters are great. Uh, people get down on the sport. They're leaving the sport. They tell me, Teddy, the sport sucks. Uh, we, we, love, we love the fighters. We love the good fights. But the, the sport, you know, it's, it's destroyed itself. No, no. Again, I'm here to remind you. The sport is still brilliant. The sport is still special. The sport is still the best. It's the people that administrate the sport that suck. And you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't forget that. And um, once again, the administration of boxing did suck uh, with that. But at the end of the day, the good news is uh, Perez rightfully won the fight. He got the decision. He got, his, he got credit for his moment. He showed up ready to, to pull off the upset. Uh, and he did it, you know. I think he was the underdog. I keep saying upset, but I'm pretty sure he was the underdog. But he pulled it off. He knew that fight would change, you know, change his life, and I hope it does. I I hope it does. Yep, very good. And then here's the one I think that you were looking at. Actually, we'll save the uh, Nanshinga and um, Curiel fight for last. Just quickly, let's touch on um, Mauricio Lara gets a majority draw against Daniel Lugo. Um, I thought Lugo won it probably by three or four rounds at super featherweight. Um, interesting fight here. Like I said, I think that um, the judges got it completely wrong, but I'm dying to hear your thoughts on this one. Majority draw. Which uh, you know certainly favors Lara, given what I what I witnessed. But I want to hear what you thought. Yeah, again, full disclosure. Watching the other fights, I jumping back and forth, so I couldn't I couldn't see the whole fight. Um, I saw 
I saw part of it, enough of it to get a feel for it, and then to pick up, uh, you know, the the vibes, if you will, hear what was out there as far as some people that I do that I do uh, appreciate their judgment. There's a lot of people in this business I don't, to be honest. They could be watching a fight right in front of me, and I I, I swear that they were watching a fight in a different continent. Um, so. <laughs> You know, uh, but from the sixth round, right around when I got in, I forget what, I think I got in around the sixth round, uh, Lugo had hurt, uh, hurt, um, hurt uh, Lara on the ropes with a hook to the body. It looked like Lara almost, it looked like he wanted to quit in the corner, to be honest. He got caught a good left yep. hook to the liver. And um, Lugo, you know, Lugo was uh, pressing the fight in the seventh round. Lava was moving, surviving, uh, coming back as he started to recover a little bit, coming back, started landing some nice counter uppercuts. Uh, Lava, Lava got back in the fight with that seventh round after being hurt so badly uh, in the sixth. Lugo stopped pressing uh and concentrated on the jab on the outside, not doing a lot behind it. But towards the end of the seventh, he started landing a couple of right hands behind the jab, which is what you're supposed to do. You set the table with the jab, then you go eat. If you're an orthodox fighter with the right. The ninth round, Lugo went back to being aggressive, going to the body again. He won the he he had won the eighth round. Uh Lugo was pressing, pressing the fight, doing the leading, getting off first, while Lara was just basically looking for spots to counter. Then the tenth and final round, you know, when when it, obviously the trainers get in your ear, tell you, hey, you better win this round. Uh, both fighters knew it uh, that it would come down to the round. Lara started pressing. Um, now changed it up instead of laying back and countering. He started pressing. Uh, he was leading. He wasn't just, as I said, snipering with the counters. Very good round. Uh, with Lugo landing the biggest shots for most of the round. But then after a head clash, Lara came back and landed some good shots. As I said, I only saw those parts of the... And I... The way I put it together, kind of like Colombo might put together, you know, a, a mystery with the a little bit of evidence that he had. Um, the the judges, like you said, they had it a draw. Lugo was the underdog. It felt to me, even with just the part I saw, that Lugo had earned the win. Um, is is that is that how you felt too? Um, definitely yeah yeah well then i'm on the right side if you thought the same because i i you saw all of it i only saw the part of it and um that's how i saw it i just i felt at the end that hey uh you know lugo earned the win and maybe they robbed him a little bit the way that you rob a guy who's the underdog uh even though a lot of people might have thought he won what do you do you make it a draw you know, that's, that's what it. that's how you do it with latex gloves uh, in boxing. That's that's how you don't leave fingerprints um, in 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 the great sport of boxing. So, yep. Now talk about great. Th this was a hell of a fight. So, go ahead. You set it up. Seventhy uh, Nanshinga. Gets his, he avenges his loss to Adrian Curell. Um, they had the first one in um, November of 23. Uh, second round knockout for Curiel. Natsinga gets his revenge. Um, awesome fight. He was deducted a point in the seventh round for a head, but he had him uh, almost out in the ninth, saved by the bell, and then he finished him 44 seconds into the tenth round. Great comeback win for Nanshinga, but man, what a fight. These guys were like going at it. Just like the first one was all action, this one uh, lived up to the hype. See, this is the one I chose to watch. 
instead of the others. And the reason I chose it, I watched the first one where Curio was a big underdog. He knocked out the champion, the world champion, Nanshinga, with one punch. A beautiful setup right hand on a button that knocked him cold. And for me, was maybe the knockout of the year. That's how devastating, how shocking, how sensational that knockout. It wasn't just a knockout. It was a knockout of the year by Curiel. And the reason I watched it, I want, I love to see the behavior of human beings, of fighters, when their behavior is most tested, most called on, most necessary to be at a good level. In other words, I love to see when people are in a position for redemption, how they act, what they do, what's inside them. Not what's outside with their their speed, their power, their technique. What's inside them? I, I want to see when a person is coming off a devastating loss the way that the champion on Shingo was. Can he behave like a champion again? What will he do? What will he do? Will, will he be shell-shocked? Will he go in there, you know, not at full level? that he would have to be, because Curiel, like the old times would say, when you win a title, you get 30% better. Customato used to always tell me that, and I always would witness it. Curiel got better. He got better. So what was Nanshinga going to do? Again, second round, big favorite. Gets knocked dead. Uh, knock out of the year. How is he going to act? And man, he acted like a guy that wanted to be a champion again. And Curiel Curia acted like a guy that wanted to keep the title. But Nanshingo was a guy who was desperate. Desperate like, like a guy trying to claw his way out of a prison cell with his fingers and his nails. You know, he, That's all he's got. And he's trying to claw his way. He's trying to scratch and claw and dig a tunnel to get out of that prison cell. That, that place where he's been locked up since the last fight where all he's had to do is, is think about what he used to have and what he didn't have anymore. And he wanted to get out of that freaking cell, out of that place. And man, oh man, I always say it, Ken, you know, being able to fight like a champion is a big part of it. Yep. But behaving like one is the biggest part of it. For sure. Knowing how to behave like a champion. And boy, oh boy, did Nanshinga, was I glad I watched this fight. First of all, IBF junior flyweight title. Curios. Uh, I, uh, like I said, it was the knockout of, of 2023 uh, for me, or one of them, if not the top one. There was one or two that were right up there. There was a couple of them, but this one was right there. First round, Curio came out like the guy who got 30% better. Pressing a fight, both going to the body, engaging. Uh, they they engaged each other, standing toe to toe. Became a telephone booth, uh, a phone booth fight, as I call it. Mm -hmm. Was uh, immediately can yep. immediately became a phone booth uh, where they were just on the inside throwing punches, and ninety five percent of their punches were one of two variations, body. Or uppercuts, because that's what you throw when you're inside. I thought it was brilliant. That's what you concentrate. Body and then bring it up to catch them after the body with the uppercut. Maybe the body makes them lean into an uppercut. Body and uppercuts, everything inside. I didn't see a jab to the seventh round. It was like like the jab. <laughs> the, <laughs> I know. the jab went the, know. the route of like the rhinoceros, rhinoceros, the or whatever, or the, the dodo bird or something. The that's dodo a, bird, yeah. Yeah, something that's <laughs> extinct. Something that you don't see a lot of. Um, because uh, uh, suddenly it's like, what am I going to see? I, I haven't seen a jab for like two days. And and <laughs> uh, and uh, there was no need for a jab. They got inside, they set up camp, they went to work. That's right. And for the most part, it was back and forth, toe to toe. Brilliant. Back, yep. forth, back, forth, back and forth. Uh, Curio had the edge. Had a little bit of the edge. He was a little bit physical he, his body is a little more physically set for inside fighting non shingo's body is longer taller 
wiry, thin, long arms. He's more set on the outside. That's how he got knocked out the first time. He was boxing on the outside, and there was distance. And with that distance, Curio caught him the right hand. He never saw the punch coming. He got knocked out. Credit to, to Nanshinga and his team. They made, a, they made adjustments. They made drastic change. They made him into an inside fighter. They, this is what they said to me without talking to him. What, what I saw from watching what I watched. They, were, they said, if we get beat, we're not getting beat because we get hit that punch again. We're not getting hit with that punch again. How do we get hit? Why do we get hit? <laughs> we got hit because we were standing up tall and there was range. We're not getting hit with that punch. We're not going to stand up tall and we're not going to give them range. They got inside. They got, they got in the trenches. They, they got in the kitchen and they, they, went, they cooked up a storm. And they matched Curio body punch for body punch, uppercut for uppercut, but they were not going to stand tall. They were not, even though that's one of his assets, that he's longer than Curio, they were not going to give him a chance to land that punch. They get beat, they get beat this way, not that way. <laughs> and it was fun to watch. It was fun to watch, especially when you can kind of follow the, the, the narration, if you will, of what I just said, that understanding where they're both coming from and what's going on mentally. Uh, Curio was dictating to the body, using uppercuts. Uh, again, the proper punches to use on the inside. Uh, second round, again, was close. Uh, good body work by Curio. Perhaps Got him that round. The rounds were really close. Nanshinga was fighting right from the beginning with a determination, as I said, to get that title back. But Curio was fighting with one to keep it. Third round, Curio's uh, trapped Nanshinga on the ropes and really, really sold out to his body. Sold out to his body. Again, 95% of the punches on both sides were to the body and uppercuts. That's that's unheard of. Uh, fourth round, Curio was being a boss, pressing, pushing on Shinga backwards, continuing his attack to the body, uh, mixing in uppercuts. Uh, you know, like I said, I, a jab was nowhere to be seen. Uh, Curio was taking charge of the fight. Taking charge of the fight. He was. Uh... I remember saying to myself, Cus was right when he told me that winning the title improves you 30%. I see it. I see it in Curio. Fifth round, Nanshinga, uh, concentrating also to the body. Uh, it's, it's like a matter of whose ribs are going to collapse first, you know? Um, Curio turned southpaw just for a minute. Uh, you know what? When he turned southpaw, Ken, I thought to myself, why did he do that? I thought he was in charge of the fight. Usually when you turn southpaw, it's either because you're desperate, you think you have to pull a, a rabbit out of the hat, change something up. He didn't have to change nothing, not to me at least. But maybe to him he did. Or because, you know, you planned on it, it, it gives you a strategic advantage, whatever. I didn't see it. I started to wonder. I wonder, it's not about what I'm seeing. It's about what Curio thinks he's seeing and what he's feeling. I don't care how I think he's in charge. This Nudshinga is a son of a gun. He's standing total. Maybe it's making him think he ain't doing as good as he's doing. Mm -hmm. And that happens to human beings sometimes. In a fight, in a contest, in whatever they're doing. That sometimes they're the last one to know how good they're doing. They only know how they feel. And they feel pressure. They feel, they feel you know, under the gun. They feel all the things you would feel when you're in a difficult situation, you know, uncomfortable. Even though they're winning, even though they're doing great, they don't know it because they don't have the luxury of being outside watching themselves. And I just had a feeling that some of that was going on. Like I said, the first fight, Nanshinga got caught a right hand as he was boxing on the outside standing straight. Uh, up and you could see the purposeful 
deliberate change in strategy and approach by Natsinga and his people. They should get, I think they should get trainers of the year just for that. Just for that. Uh, he was bending his knees on the inside, getting small, making sure he did not get caught that kind of punch. Sixth round, Natsinga made a change. He started throwing real nice, tiny, short, unbelievable Joe Lewis short shots on the inside, punching in between. Instead of just banging with him, he started now punching in between Curio's punches, timing him, and it was a change. It was a little change, a little. You could see the tide slightly turning. For me, that sixth round, a uh, better round for Nanshinga. And for me, it was the first round that he won, I thought, at least for several. Um, and then all of a sudden, wow, the referee takes a point away from Nanshinga in the seventh round for using his head, butting. I got to be honest with you. I disagreed with it because both fighters were in there with their heads like billy goats. <laughs> They, uh, <laughs> Ken, they were like billy goats because of the style of fight, not purposely. And um, anyway, close round. Curio, again, um, trapped Nanchinga on the ropes a little bit. Uh, close round. I thought Nanchinga might have gotten it, but if it was a 10-8 round because of that point deduction, that that. That could change the whole fight, obviously. Uh, the way it looked like it was going down to the scorecards at that time. And I'm sure that his people told him that. Um, so, round eight, Curio started using his jab now on the outside, which again was curious to me. He fought the whole fight in a phone booth. The whole fight, like in his freaking suitcase. You know what I mean? Yep. And now, all of a sudden, he's outside. To me, he was... I know people say, but Teddy, it's strategy. He's smart. He's, you need your jab. All right. I'm telling you, sometimes it ain't that. It was almost like he was making a concession. It was almost like he was saying, the heat got a little too hot. And I need to go out on the patio and cool off a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> one problem that guy named Nanshinga he was going to follow him out on the patio yep and 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 not let him cool off that's right and more than that more important than that it's a psychological game too life is psychological more than that Ken Nanshinga noticed what I noticed he noticed when he for the first time started jabbing oh wait a minute he don't want to be in here no more. Oh, wait a minute. He, he He's cracking a little bit, maybe. Not big cracks. Only the special guys can see the small micro cracks. Yep. The micro, micro cracks. Guys like Nanshinga, he's in there. He can see him in, in himself, and he can see him in somebody else. And I think he saw something, just a little something. He said, oh. The guy, the guy wants separation now. Huh. He didn't want separation for seven rounds, six rounds. And it did something. All of a sudden, Nanshinga, when he had that space, that little bit of space, all of a sudden he went back to one of the physical assets that he's always had that he didn't use in this fight for a reason because he got caught with space in the, in, the re, in the first fight. But now that Curio was giving him space in a way where he was giving in a little bit, where the, it wasn't with the same way that he was doing it in the first fight, now he's given space in a way to get away from something. Not to get to something, but to get away from something. I think Nanshinga, he read that. And all of a sudden, like I said, this phone booth fight, all of a sudden, 
Nansinga started letting his hands go with full range, the longer hands, the longer arms, and started letting some shots go when there was a little bit of space. And Curio, for me, was better off in close because of his body, the his body makeup, the shorter guys, shorter arms, the, what he was doing. But even though he was doing it so well, sometimes the pressure of doing it is greater than the success of doing it. Does that make sense, Ken? Yep. The, the pressure right. in his mind didn't allow him to really focus on the success or to see the success. And now, all of a sudden, Nanshinga started throwing. He's throwing these short shots on the inside, like I said, really short shots, uh, catching them with these really short shots. And it was a, in the eighth round, it was a big round for Nanshinga. A big round. It changed a little in the sixth, but now Nanshinga, with all of that going on, he had the better on the inside now with the short shots where he was catching and doing some damage to Curio. Maybe that's what made Curio go outside. That probably had a lot to do with what made Curio go outside with the jab, Ken, because those yeah. short little Joe Lewis shots where he was timing him in between Curio's shots really made him say, oh, I, I better get out of here. So he goes <laughs> outside. <laughs> he goes outside now. Nanshinga now has changed his fight. He, he's The biggest round of the night is the eighth round for Nanshinga. Now it's the ninth round. Fight has now had ebbs and flows. After Curio was in charge, first half, a little more than the first half, yeah, first half, uh, and a lot of head clashes, all that stuff, the short punches, all of it started to add up to Curio, to bother him, obviously to shake him, and allow Nanshinga to take charge in the ninth. And he hurt Curio at the end of the round with big shots. Two big shots, um, but two two big rounds in a row. The eighth and the ninth. And again, in the ninth round, now that there was separation, Nanshinga started to uh, use that separation after fighting a whole night inside with the long arms, now it's like, even though he got caught in that first fight, now it's like, okay, now we can fight on the outside. It's safe to fight on the outside because we broke him down. We broke him down. We took away some of his will. We, he's not going to catch us on the outside now. Now we, we did the job on the inside all night to get to this place. And now that we're at this place and we're in charge, now we can actually go back outside where we have always had the advantage because we got longer arms, we're, we're more wiry, we're taller, we, we get leverage on our punches, wiry guys, when they have room to punch, they get leverage on their punch. Now we're going to go outside. It's the right time. It's no longer the wrong time like it was in the first fight. It's the right time. It was really brilliant. I, I loved it. Yeah. And now he catches he catches Curiel on the outside with separation. Um that he that he went out of his way to make sure there was no separation all night. Yeah. <laughs> now he goes, he gets separation and he hurts Curiel. The bell saved Curio. Nanshinga came right out in the tent. He knew what time it was. He knew what he had to do. He came right out in the tent round, going right back after Curio, completely in charge, 
Hurt him again with a beautiful, beautiful short counter. Went back inside and drew, and drew a beautiful short counter on the inside. Hurt him. And then he finished him. He just bombarded him. He never let up. And he got the finish. Again, great, great effort performance by Nanshinga. Simply fighting, behaving like a, a man who wanted that title. Uh, you know, he lost the first half of the of the fight. I would have loved to see the scorecards. He lost the first half of the fight. Uh, had it looking like Curiel might stop him. Uh, really, I mean, Curiel was 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 in a good rhythm, uh, and then he completely turned it around. All respect and credit to Nanshinga. That's how you behave like a champion coming back from a devastating KO that had dethroned him. It was a really, for me, as you can see, Ken, it was really interesting. It was like, uh, it, was, it was like reading a book. Yeah. Where, where you're reading different chapters. Like one chapter, it's, it's there, and then the next chapter takes you to, an, you know, to another place, to another part of a person's life. Um, it, it was, I'm glad I chose to watch that fight for the reasons I chose. Yeah. That was a great one. Um, well, Teddy, that's all we got on the boxing. We hit all the UFC fights. Um, you got anything else before we say goodbye? Um, if you're going to fight on the inside, throw short punches. Uh, <laughs> you real Tighten up your defense. Get really tight up your defense. Cuss always would drum that into my head. Tighten up your defense. Leave no holes and throw real... Sh your punches have to become short. And... Um, yeah, Nanshinga's punches became short. But no, in all seriousness, I think there's lessons always in in fights. And I think the lessons he had to be gotten, that here you had a guy who got knocked out, lost his title, and, you know, he he didn't give up on himself. He He actually, I would say he looked at that as an opportunity to show how good he really was. And and that's what I want to finish on. I think that's it. Yeah. That's what I would like to put out there as a lesson of the day, as as the motto of the day, whatever you want to, whatever it is, but that sometimes we look at the loss, the negative that's going on in our life as uh, obviously a stumbling block, sometimes a, uh, more than a stumbling block, sometimes a damn hole in the road that that we fall into yep. and we can't get out of. And I would just say, switch it around and look at it sometimes as an opportunity now to find out how good you're really supposed to be. That's right. That's right. Well, Teddy, thanks for that. Um, Guys, thanks for being with us. Do us a favor and subscribe to the show on YouTube. It helps us in massive ways, honestly. Like the videos, but please subscribe. If you don't subscribe, and, um, if you don't get us <laughs> up to... Uh, Ken's laughing because he knows where I'm going. Uh, if he don't, if, if you don't do it and you don't get us up, we're over 300,000. You don't get us to half a million. That sounds good, right, Sam? Yep. You don't get us to half a million. Get us moving towards that. You know what? You're going to turn this thing on and guess what? I ain't going to be here. <laughs> We're not going to be here. That's, because if I'm not here, Ken, Ken's going with me. All right? And we show up every week. Today's a holiday. My kids are out of I, school, yeah, so they're that's, running around like crazy. You, and uh, I ain't threatening you. I'm just saying, if you enjoy this, well, then do something about it. Get your friends to 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 log in and DVR or something. What do you, I don't know what that is. <laughs> but subscribe subscribe and we'll be back next week to talk about all the action from the upcoming weekend hope you guys have a great week and i hope everyone's enjoying the long weekend thanks for being with us and teddy i will uh, see you soon boom